the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to call on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to call on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name, in the name of the Father. In the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to call on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering, as your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you. Lift it on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name, morning turns to song. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us online. Hope you're having a good weekend. Um, I've got a couple of announcements. Um, so the first one's not easy to talk about. Uh, it's finances. At our AGM, which we had a couple weeks ago, um, we said that we were in good shape for the end of the year, and we were. Our, uh, the money we brought in um, equaled our expenses, which is always nice. Um, but the start of the year hasn't been good, and um, so we wanted to let the congregation know um, before it gets too far. Um, so we're going to send around the figures in the weekly bulletin, and we'll continue with a monthly update after that. But we wanted to let everybody know that that was the case. Okay. Um, another announcement is that youth is this Friday from 6 till 8, 
and it's at the church, and please bring your masks. Okay, that's it for announcements. Scripture reading is Colossians 3, 15 to 17. Colossians 3, 15 to 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the freedom that you give us to come together and worship you without being worried about persecution, that we can raise up your name and not be worried, Lord. And we ask that you'd be with our fellow believers around the world that do not have that freedom, that have to meet in secret um, because they will be persecuted. We ask that you would give them your peace, your strength, and your courage, Lord, and your protection as they continue to meet in your name. And Lord, we thank you for the peace that you give us. We thank you that for that because in this world that we live in, there is always trouble. Things are never going really well, and we just thank you, Lord, that we can always rely on your peace. And no matter what's going on in our lives, that we have your peace to fall back on. And Lord, we ask that, um, that we would always show your glory in all that we do, Lord. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for Pastor Larry, that he always teaches from your word. And Lord, we ask that you would prepare us to hear that your message and to put it into action in our lives. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen.
Welcome to Houston Baptist Church. Uh, good to have you with us, even if it is just online. I would definitely prefer if we had uh, bodies in the pews and faces to greet and people to say hello to face to face. Uh, in fact, because we don't have that, I think uh, we're missing an opportunity to really demonstrate fully um, the defining characteristic of Christianity that Jesus presented in John 13, 34 and 35, he said, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know you're my disciples, if you love one another. It's great to be able to gather in some sense, but we really aren't gathering, folks, until we're in the same building together. Let's be praying that this gets resolved soon so that we don't have to end up in some kind of a conflict to be doing exactly what is right. Um, it's great to be able to share that love face to face. And if every church could actually practice that and do it well, I think they could honestly say that their church would be filled with selfless love and forgiveness and a deep seated, settled peace because that's who Jesus is. But we know from practice before COVID or in any church that you go to in the last many number of years, and you can go right back to the time of Jane's, um, some churches, or at least relationships within them, rather than peace, they look more like pandemonium. Uh, you're marked more by conflict than by cooperation, or maybe even by feuds instead of friendship. Um, we don't follow that mandate to love one another as we should always. And so sometimes instead of resembling Jesus, we can look a little bit more like the Hatfields and the McCoys. And most people are familiar with that feud. It took place along the uh, West Virginia-Kentucky border in the mid to late 60s of 1800, just around the Civil War time. And uh, it continued for almost 30 years, I think 27, 28 years, with the death toll being about half a dozen on each side. In fact, it lasted so long that they sort of lost sight of the actual cause. Some people would credit it to uh, opposing views on uh, Civil War allegiances, some Confederate, some Union. But others would say, oh no, it actually started uh, over, uh, the dispute started because someone spotted a pig in a Hatfield's pig, pig sty that, well, a McCoy thought it was his. The identity of a pig <laughs> maybe started a war of some degree that lasted for close to 30 years. Um, Truth be told, when we demand our way, it is very costly. Last Sunday, we looked at godly wisdom and the rich benefits that 
come from that. Things like peace and uh, a settled mercy. Um, there's a consideration of others, a willingness to yield, but it's peace loving, peace loving. That's the goal that every Christian um, should be seeking. It's certainly how we glorify the Lord. But as we come to chapter 4 of James, and we're continuing in that letter, we recognize from James' opening question that it's pretty clear that some of the churches he addressed um, weren't feeling peace with each other, and maybe not even with themselves. So we're going to be in uh, James chapter 4, read the first six verses, and then we'll pray. So he's just been talking about the amazing peace that comes uh, from actually following godly wisdom. And then he jumps into conflict, and this is what he says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may um, spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. All let's pray. Thank you, Father, for another opportunity to look into your word. We're blessed to be able to do this anytime we want. And as we do that this morning, <clears throat> Lord, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would open our ears and our minds to the word that he wants to plant in our hearts, that as we consider conflict, its source, and, uh, and uh, what we should be thinking about instead of our own interests, that it would take root in our hearts, Father, would change us, that it would the conviction that the Spirit brings would also bring with it a desire to correct things that need to be corrected. So we invite you to do that work and thank you for your presence here and in us individually. And we give you praise in Jesus' name for all that you do. Amen. So this passage is clearly about conflict and I think about the damage that comes from um, sinful desires. And there's a couple of things in light of what James presents here that that we should do. And the first of them is simply recognize the cause of conflict. Recognize the true cause of conflict. Where does it come from? Now, if we didn't have this input from James in this letter, we might think his question, where do quarrels and fights come, was not all that tough to answer because we know where they come from. Somebody says something to us, does something wrong that offends us, and, and then uh, we end up fighting because, well, they need to be straightened out. You know, if everyone just wised up, we wouldn't have to be battling all the time. And that's, that's the image that James presents in conflict. It is a battle. Fights, the first word in the NIV here, is usually translated war, you know, with the idea that it's a lengthy, serious conflict. Uh, quarrels, the second word in the NIV, also refers to combat or conflict of some kind. Sometimes it's translated strife. Uh, now, I don't know when James used these two words, whether he was trying to distinguish one from the other, but if he was, maybe the first one, fights or war, refers to a prolonged conflict, something that involves a history of some kind with a number of people, somewhat like the Hatfield and the McCoy feud that started over a pig. And maybe the second one, quarrels, maybe that refers more to those uh, spontaneous flash-in-the-pan quarrels that surface between individuals, and sometimes they pass just as quickly. But whatever his intent was, uh, both kinds of disputes have the same cause. And James is pretty clear that it is not something that's wrong with the other person, but that it is in ourselves. You know, human nature being what it is, we would love to be able to pin that problem of a conflict on someone else, but James doesn't let us get away with that. In fact, he takes that pointing finger and he turns it right back on us, and that's where it should actually be parked. And he says the trouble <clears throat> starts with desires that battle within you. 
Now, admittedly, you could argue, I suppose, that he's talking about battles within a church because there's different preferences, different desires, and that's what causes the problem. But there's a passage in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. It's a parallel passage to this, and it reads, Abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Pretty clearly, it's talking about an inner struggle, and I'm sure James means exactly that same thing. We'd like to blame others, but the problem of conflict starts inside of us. I mean, Paul presents that conflict in James, or pardon me, Galatians 5.17, where he says, The sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. He's saying that if we are taking our cue from the wisdom of the sinful nature, uh, we are never going to do what we want, the right thing. And so when a discussion with someone uh, morphs suddenly into a fight, it's always because of selfish desires. Instead of listening to the heavenly wisdom of the Spirit, within us, the sinful nature's selfish desires, that's what gets the upper hand. And that wisdom, we're told, is of the devil in James uh, 3.15. And we know that it's marked by selfish ambition. And so peace is replaced by pandemonium or disorder. Verse 16 of that chapter says that uh, it leads to disorder and every evil practice. And it's all because of our desires or our pleasures. In verse 3, it mentions pleasures. Now, the Greek word is hedone. It's where we get um, the word hedonism, which, of course, is that uh, idea that the absolute most important thing in life is to make sure that all our sensual desires are answered for us. And it's often uh, referring to sinful, self-indulgent pleasures. But the word hedone simply means pleasures. And I think that when James uses it, he's saying that Every single pleasure we have, um, it starts inside of us. And because we have a sinful nature, I think we could say it begins with sinful desires, what we really want for ourselves. And any times, folks, that we lose that struggle with the sinful nature that Paul described, uh, sinful desires get the upper hand. And then it very naturally leads to conflict with other people because, you see, we all suffer from that same failing taking the wrong wisdom. Now, sometimes church conflict is over something very important like doctrine. And, you know, we need to hold our ground then and we need to sort those things out. It needs to be dealt with. And sometimes the only solution is for some people to go their separate ways to a place where their doctrine meshes more with what they believe. But more often than not, the disputes in a church begin with a desire to have our own way. It's a clashing of personal preferences. Hey, there's countless churches who have split over the style and the content of the worship songs that they sing, and it has been sadly but aptly named the Worship Wars. Good night. I mean, what must God think when His children fight over the best way to praise or worship Him? And disputes can arise uh, over things as simple as what time the morning service starts, whether or not the Sunday school is during the service or after, maybe what color the new carpet that you're going to install should be. The battles that we face are as varied as the people in the congregation and the personal preferences and desires that we have. And folks, most of those things, they come from thinking that uh, the universe revolves around our special interests or desires or the position that we take on things. And when we don't get what we want, then it generally escalates into conflict. James actually speaks of kill and coveting here in verse 2 as one of the consequences of uh, frustrated desires that don't come to fruition. Now, he could mean, I suppose, that people got so angry that they resorted to murder. I doubt that's the case, or he would have done a little bit more than just acknowledge um, that murder takes place. Uh, I think what he's probably doing is remembering the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount uh, from Matthew 5, 21 and 22, where he's remembering that 
Jesus said that uh, anger and murder, they're pretty much in the same class when it comes to judgment. He says, you've heard it said, do not murder, and anyone that does murder subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who's angry with his brother is subject to judgment. Or perhaps James was simply warning people, as I mentioned, that it is a possibility that if selfish desires are not curbed or given up, um, they can potentially lead to something like murder. And we see that with the Hatfields and McCoys. I mean, if it started over a pig or the Civil War, it doesn't much matter. It didn't lead to murder, shouldn't have led to murder. At the very least, one thing we do know for sure is that conflict can kill relationships, and it points to the tremendous danger, the evil that's associated with selfish desires. It can lead to murderous anger or envy. Now, when moral purity or doctrine is at stake, as I said, we really do need to hold our ground, but in issues of personal preference that aren't all that vital, we need to be ready to yield, uh, to accommodate the interests, the feelings of other people. And this is one of the benefits of godly wisdom. One of the marks, James said, is it's a willingness to yield. So folks, if we heeded the Holy Spirit's prompting, um, we would be so uh, in love with peace that we would just yield in the non-essentials. We wouldn't force our hands. And I think most quarrels that do surface would die a quick death because after all, it does take two people to fight. Proverbs 15, 1, a well-known verse, you know, says a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. What are we thinking about, uh, are we thinking about the other person's interest uh, when a dispute arises? Paul gives us some really good advice in uh, if he, or Philippians 2, 4, where he says, everyone should look not only to their own interests, I mean, we have to do that to survive, everyone should look not only to their own interests, but also to the interests of others. And he goes on to say, our attitude should be the same as that of Christ. Personal preferences, they're fine. We all have them. But folks, they should never um, become unyielding demands. If we actually cared more about the interests of others, we would have peace, even if we didn't always get exactly what we wanted. In fact, if everyone honored Philippians 4.2, we'd all be getting our interests looked after. And hey, the conflict or most of the conflict and dissatisfaction in the church would all but disappear. And selfish desires, the failure to think of anyone but yourself, that's the heart of conflict. So James sets that clear, and he also, I think, suggests that there's a failure to do something else that contributes to conflict. Quarrels result when what? When we don't get what we want. And James says in, in verse 2, um, you do not have because you do not ask God. So I think he's saying that failure to pray ultimately contributes to conflict. We know what we want, we think we know what we want, but we're not wise enough most of the time. James 1.5 says, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given him. I think he's saying if we are not asking things of God, we do not have full access to the wisdom of God. So the only voice we actually hear in that situation is that of earthly wisdom, the stuff that comes from the devil and the world around us that they very eagerly offer to us. In fact, the very last thing the devil wants for us to do is to pray because it short circuits, it blocks that selfish wisdom that actually generates conflict and then fuels it. Satan, he's content for us to work very busily, even at good things in the church, as long as we think we're too busy to pray. Prayer is vital. Uh, communing with God is what actually suppresses selfish desires and replaces them with those qualities of godly wisdom we see in verse 17 of chapter 3. And so when selfish desires diminish, conflict has no fuel to feed on. It's that simple. If we sought God's wisdom in the midst of disputes, or better, before we even started one, 
hey, uh, most of what is a problem in the church could be solved before it turns into an all-out feud. Folks, it's really hard for anger to escalate when you're praying for someone else. It, it takes the focus off of us. Uh, peace is available, but we have to ask God for it. So prayer is vital. But James also adds that uh, we need to ask correctly. In verse 3, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. And then he says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, he never really says what it was they wanted that they did not get, but it seems that they might have gotten it if they'd asked correctly. I mean, God isn't a killjoy. He, he wants to bless us with good things. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. We first have to delight in him for that to be true. Matthew 7, back in the Sermon on the Mount, um, verses 7 to 11, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. To him who knocks, the door is opened. Uh, and he goes on to say, Your Father in heaven gives good gifts to those who ask him. But these promises of getting uh, answered and receiving what we ask for is immediately followed in verse 12 with this command, and I think it's a conditional one. Do to others as you would have them do to you. We wonder why some prayers aren't answered. We're asking with wrong motives. It sounds like he's saying if we put self-interest aside, if we begin to think of others, we can have what we ask for. And of course, we need to make sure what we ask for uh, meshes with God's will for us, that our desires are the right ones. Things like asking that we might delight more in God, that our, our fear, our reverence for Him would grow, or that we would um, seek to uh, have a greater concern for the interests of others. When we have those motives, when our motives are right, we can expect to receive. So James says that uh, prayer goes unanswered because of wrong motives. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you might spend, and the word means to spend completely or to waste, spend what you get on your pleasures. Folks, God expects us to use what we ask of him for his glory, not for our self-gratification. He expects us um, to focus on self-sacrifice not self-service. So selfish desires are at the root of every conflict with others. And boy, it's a reason for unanswered prayer. If we're thinking about self, we're probably asking for the wrong things. So James really wants us to recognize the danger of selfish desires. They destroy relationships and they are dangerous for us. And because of that, I think that there's a second thing he wants us to do, along with recognizing the true source of conflict, that it comes from within us, I think the second thing he wants us to do is to consider the cost of serving self, because there is a cost that comes with it. He wants us to focus less on self, more on God and on others. And to encourage that, he points to the dangerous position that selfish desires put us in. Yes, they put us in conflict with others, and that can be faithful, but painful. But more importantly, it pits us against God himself. James, as he wrote this letter, I mean, you can see he had this habit of lovingly addressing the readers. Uh, he did this uh, right in the beginning. He, he, he used my brothers or my dear brothers. As he speaks these words or wrote them, you can almost hear the warmth in his voice, but... Boy, that changes dramatically in chapter 4, verse 4. You can almost hear him shouting, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. You adulterous people. Now, the NAV doesn't reveal it in its translation, but adulterous is actually feminine. Uh, in the original. It's you adulteresses, and he's not targeting ladies in this, thinking that they're the problem. It's actually uh, a very appropriate because Scripture um, 
often speaks of the relationship God has with his people in marital terms. You look at something like Isaiah 54, verses 5 and 6. God is presented as a husband, Israel as the wife. In uh, Jeremiah 2, 2, uh, God is remembering the devotion of Israel as a bride who loved him. You get to Hosea, chapter 1 and 2 in particular, Israel is pictured in the person of Gomer, that's Homer's unfaithful wife. Israel is pictured as an adulterous wife because she is chased after and given herself to all of these countries and the idols that they worshipped uh, without any kind of caution or care. You adulteresses, James says. Boy, does that sound a little close to home, maybe? Hey, even in our promiscuous culture, um, no one wants to be called an adulterer. You know, it conjures up images of betrayal and abandonment, uh, deep hurt, heartbreak. So James is rightly angry at this adultery. I mean, it suggests that the churches that he was contacting were maybe rubbing shoulders a little closer with the world um, than should be expected. We need to talk to them to save them. But they were becoming friends with the world. We see that in the, the favoritism that was shown to the rich man. And maybe they were doing this to avoid punishment or maybe they just wanted um, to have a little something extra. What on earth would James uh, say about the North American church today in light of that? Boy, I mean, people can show up at church when we could actually do that on God's arm, so to speak, uh, loving on each other, singing songs together, looking great. Who misses that? But, you know, during the week, friendship with the world uh, can pull people away from that godly uh, character and into things that actually make us adulteresses or adulterers, things that hurt the heart of God. Friends with the world. What's a friend? I mean, a friend is someone who shares the same values, the same interests, maybe the same lifestyle. James uh, earlier called Abraham God's friend, and he did that because of his faithful obedience, his devotion to God. Not even um, the command from God to sacrifice his son Isaac, which didn't come to pass because God provided a ram, not even that could budge Abraham from his love for his God. It's amazing self-sacrifice, amazing faithfulness, friend of God. Abraham wouldn't even think of being less than faithful to God. Adultery, you know, for all of us, the idea of adultery should be unthinkable. I mean, who wants to hurt their spouse if your marriage is reasonably good? Hopefully no one. No one wants to be labeled an adulterer because of the infidelity it packs on you. But it happens, doesn't it? And what is the cause of physical adultery? Well, selfish desires, looking at, longing for something that's off limits for you, not guarding the hearts or the eyes, not building protective hedges in the relationships that you do have. Hey, if you spend a bunch of unguarded time with someone of the opposite sex who's not your spouse, while well, you're flirting with failure, if you don't spend time with your spouse, uh, the affection in your relationship fades. Communication begins to suffer, and then your relationship is open to sabotage. A marriage needs to be nurtured. We all need to do a better job of that. Your spouse needs to be the object of your affections to the exclusion of everyone else. And Folks, the same is true. The exact same thing is true of our relationship with God. This is why James raises this image of adultery. Friendship with the world seduces us and lures us away from time with God, and then it presents the possibility of unfaithfulness. Communication definitely suffers. He says you do not have because you do not ask. Don't even bother to ask. I think prayerlessness is a key indicator of friendship with the world. You know, something unworthy of our attention attracts it, lures us, and robs us of time with God. We need to recognize the danger of flirting with the world. I mean, how would you feel if you saw your spouse flirting with someone else 
How would you feel if you caught them in an act of adultery? It would make you feel incredibly unloved. Probably it would make them think that, you, that they hated you. This is what James is saying is true of us when we give our love to the world when we are pledged to God. Friendship with the world is hatred towards God. That is how God himself views it. He goes on to say, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Hey, every sin is a choice, folks. The devil doesn't make us do it. I mean, you don't accidentally commit spiritual adultery any more than you would accidentally commit physical adultery. It starts with not nurturing the relationship that you have and then flirting with danger. It makes us enemies of God. So it's hurtful to him, and boy, it's dangerous for us. I mean, think about what God has done for us. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 10. Uh, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He says in verse 10, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. God sent his only son to us to die for us that we might no longer be his enemies, that we might through faith in Jesus um, gain his righteousness and become part of the family through faith in him, no longer enemies. So are we foolish enough um, to even think about compromising that priceless, undeserved gift for a fling with the world because something looks attractive and well, it'll just be a short thing? James knows that we need motivation to prevent or to correct any hostility uh, between us and God. And he gives that to us in verse 5 where he says this. He's just been talking about being God's enemy, and he says, Or do you think Scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? Now, this is a really difficult verse to translate. It could, as the NIV indicates here, refer to our tendency to envy, because we know that's a human trait. Or it could, as the New American Standard puts it, he, meaning God, he jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us, meaning that God jealously longs for us. Scholars are not in agreement on the proper way to translate this, and there's good support for translations on both sides, both of the two I presented to you. And in fact, both of them are true, aren't they? We do tend towards envy, and God is a jealous God. He says as much in Exodus 20, verse 5, in Exodus 34, 14. He says, I'm a jealous God. He longs for our faithfulness. That's the spirit he put in us, to belong to him. No, as is normal, um, context needs to be the deciding factor here. So which is it? Human envy's just been discussed. So that could push us in that direction. But the most immediate context is verse 4, where we see this image of adultery and um, the point that God is our only true spouse. So if flirting with the world leads to spiritual unfaithfulness, we find ourselves at odds with a jealous God. And it's clear that verse 5 is tied to verse 4. So I think that the best fit in this context is that it means God jealously longs for us for our faithfulness. And James is driving home the point that as a jealous spouse who shares us with no one else, God is heartbroken and angered over our adultery with the world. He expects absolute faithfulness from the people who are pledged to him. I mean, his jealous love for us, that should endear him to us and keep us from ever even thinking about straying from absolute faithfulness. I think James' point is, is, how on earth can you be a spiritual adulterer in light of a God who jealously loves you and longs for you so much? How can you think about hurting him? 
And hey, the idea of being an enemy of an all-powerful God, hey folks, that should make us reject even the slightest hint of a thought of being less than faithful to him. And if you read this verse in this light that God is jealously longing for us, it really does pave the way for the call to repentance that we'll see in verses uh, 7 to 10 the next time we meet. He longs for us to come back to him. That's, that's what he's saying, and he's a jealous God. And so then we understand that in verse 6, his grace is what enables us to live up to those exclusive expectations he has for us as a jealous God. Not easy, but God will give us the grace to do that. And he also gives us grace if we happen to fail. He forgives us. Verse 6 reads this way, But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6 is telling us God gives grace to the humble. That are the, it refers to those who set aside self-serving interests and uh, ask God for wisdom. They ask God for the direction they need. It's the proud who don't ask God for anything, in many cases don't believe in him at all. Christians can be proud too, and it could apply to them. But these are people who tend to befriend the world because they think that's going to give them everything they want out of life. Those are the people who will discover that they're at odds, not just with other people who share those same selfish desires, but with God himself, an enemy of God. What a dangerous position to be in. And this is an appropriate place to just say, if, if you haven't uh, surrendered in faith to Jesus to make him Lord and master of your life, um, you are still an enemy. Uh, we, when we were enemies, uh, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son if uh, we put our hope and faith in that death being sufficient to save us. Otherwise, we're still on a path to death row. We're enemies of God, eternal enemies, if that doesn't change. Hey, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. It's not a tough choice. Uh, be an enemy or be a child of God that he longs to see draw closer to him. So if you don't know Jesus, hey, just looking at the fact that God is an enemy of those who don't belong to him, those who have cozied up to the world and are following it, um, that should push your decision in the right direction. Don't leave it undone because you think the world is going to give you something that you're going to miss if you come to Jesus. James is pretty clear. He wants us to recognize that conflict with others and with God himself starts with friendship with the world, selfish desires that we want to meet no matter what. And he wants us to consider the seriousness of that situation and be motivated enough to prevent it or to cure it if we've already failed. And both of those, the, pre the prevention and the cure for this is found in a faithful devotion to God because of his amazing grace for us and his jealous longing to make us his own good question to ask yourself as we draw to a close here is where do you find yourself this morning in relationship with other people most importantly with God have selfish desires uh, flirting with the world a little bit too much maybe put your friendship uh, with others at uh, risk Hello, Christians maybe has it put your relationship with God in jeopardy Friendship with the world is hatred towards God. And does James' uh, charge of spiritual adultery and friendship with the world, does that ring a little louder in our ears than is comfortable? Uh, maybe we all need to uh, cut those ties to the world a little more cleanly and not stray so easily into things that dishonor the Lord. Or maybe there's some unyielding desire that you have had that has created a conflict with someone else that needs to be resolved. You know, today would be a good day to attempt to work on that and correct it. Or maybe just prayerlessness or selfish prayer has left you 
feeling frustrated because of unanswered prayer. We all need to make God-centered prayer a greater priority. We need to embrace heavenly wisdom. Let's listen to the Spirit's voice of wisdom and do whatever is necessary to make things right with God and others. We need to do that, folks, because real faith is marked by peace with God and others, and may he increasingly lead us to that. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you are a loving God, that you are slow to anger and rich in love. I mean, it's great that that's the case, and we rely on that. But maybe sometimes we rely on it so much we do nothing to correct our faults and we don't curb our selfish desires the way we should. Lord, I pray just uh, reading this this morning and seeing the urgency, um, the anger that James had at spiritual adultery would move us to that place where we want nothing more, we desire nothing more than to walk closely with you, to honor you, to bring you glory rather than uh, self-gratification that would be the kind of people that others could look at and say, look at the love they have for others and identify us as the disciples that we are. I pray for those who don't know you, who might be watching this, Father, that they would be moved at the thought of being your enemy to surrender in faith and find the love, that jealous longing that will protect us, save us and provide us with an eternity that is rich in hope. So thank you for who you are. Thank you for your word and the impact it has on our lives. And we give you praise, Father, in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.
sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. Lord, I'll worship your holy name. Well, folks, conflict with others is conquered by peace with God. He's all about peace and reconciliation. We have to ask for it. Hey, a deeper allegiance to him and a decreasing one to self will increasingly provide that peace that we long for. And with that in mind, it's ours for the asking. Uh, I'm going to close with uh, the words of Paul from 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 3, verse 16. This is what he wrote to those people. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. Peace with him, peace with others is found in that close walk with him. Go in peace and you will find it with others because of that.